Ladies and gentlemen, we want to welcome back to the stage Kate Brax. She's going to walk us through and talk us through some So what we're going to do is we're going to make a rich dark chocolate mousse with a mandarin oil and spiced praline. Now the chocolate mousse is not going to be your traditional chocolate mousse. You know how normally a chocolate mousse, for those of you who cook desserts, a normal chocolate mousse has chocolate, egg yolks, and then you fold in egg whites and cream and that kind of thing. This one's simpler. Yeah. yeah. So, but one of the things I learned on, on MasterChef, of course, was about timing. You know, you've got a very limited time, you've got to get things on the plate. And so you always start, of course, with the things that take the longest time. So we're actually going to start with the spiced praline, then we'll move on to the chocolate mousse, and then we'll do the mandarin oil. Now, for a spice praline, you obviously need spices. So what I'm going to do is just going to show you a little bit about toasting spices. I'm hopefully going to show you. <laughs> Helps if you have a bit of gas. So, um, we will get there. <laughs> That's leaking. We'll try another one. This is what I probably should have used before we started, hey? <laughs> generally comes when the water is cold and the chocolate is melted. So what happens is, is that you can imagine cold water, melted chocolate, it's going to start to set it, but not set it properly, so it sets it in little bits, and that's how you get chocolate seasoning. So if we heat up the chocolate, uh, sorry, heat up the water and put the chocolate into the bowl, um, 
then we don't have a problem with it seizing. And chocolate can actually hold quite a bit of water, which I never knew, but now I do. Now you'll notice here, I'm actually using two different types of chocolate. I'm using dark chocolate as well as milk chocolate. Is that a telephone? No? Okay. <laughs> telephone. Oh, we've got fire. All right. Yeah. We've got so much fire. We have fire. That's the just careful. Here we go. Let's put it there. Okay. Let's move that away. <laughs> awesome. Well done. Thank you very much. Now, as I say, so we've got dark chocolate and I'm using milk chocolate. The reason is, as you probably notice on MasterChef, you hear the judges talk a lot about balance. Oh, the balance is a bit out on that thing. Oh, it's got good balance. What they're talking about is that combination of sweet, sour, salt together in any dish. They're the three main flavours. Um, you can, in other cuisines, have hot. You can also have bitter. And you can have this new one that they've called over the last few years umami, which kind of means meatiness, savouriness of something. So part of the reason that I, like in my chocolate mousse, use a combination of dark chocolate and milk chocolate is because dark chocolate is by nature bitter um, and milk chocolate is by nature sweet. So we get that beautiful balance of the two of them together. In this particular case, I'm using more dark than milk just because I like that combination. If you have some passion for um, dark chocolate, there's no reason why you couldn't put all dark chocolate in here, or vice versa for the milk chocolate. So we've got 150 grams of the milk chocolate and 250 grams of the dark chocolate. And then I'm actually going to add 350 mils of boiling water. And then we're just going to pour that over the chocolate and let it sit there for a minute and obviously it's going to melt the chocolate. What we're then going to do is we're going to, once we've, we've melted it, given it a chance to sort of melt, we're actually then just going to stir it very slowly on a low speed um, and it will gradually come together. So we'll keep an eye on that and I can show you how that goes. But let's get on to the other bit, which was the spices. Those tea towels have disappeared, thanks. Could lick my hand, but you know. <laughs> so, as I was saying, we are going to use a combination of spices. Now, spice in um, spice and chocolate is not something that I've used a lot of in the past, but I played around with it quite a lot in the MasterChef house when I came across a chef that had this dessert that looked amazing that used spices, but not your typical spices that you'd think of to go with chocolate like cinnamon or nutmeg. Instead, he used things like coriander seed and peppercorn and initially when I saw it I thought hmm not sure about that one but somebody in the house tried it and said hey Kate, come and have a taste of this I was blown away um, and when you think about it Mexicans have been using spice and chocolate for thousands of years and so I've played around with it quite a bit since then I do have a couple of different desserts where I combine chocolate and spices and this is one of them now when you're toasting spices well when you're using spices the, the best way to get the most flavour is, of course, to use whole spices. But to get the flavour out of them, you actually need to heat them because they have little oils inside them and when the heat is applied, those cell walls soften and it allows the oils out. Technically, uh, you should be heating them at such a low rate that you can put your hand into the pan to swirl them around. Camp stoves particularly this one. <laughs> I'm not sure if I trust, so I might use an implement today. But that gives you an idea. If you know your own cooktop, it's a really low temperature. So we've got a couple of teaspoons of coriander seed. We've also got uh, a teaspoon, I think it's a teaspoon, one and a half teaspoons of peppercorns. You'd think I'd know all my recipes off by heart, but I've written hundreds now and I forget them sometimes. We're also using um, cardamom seed. Now, cardamom seed generally, cardamom generally comes as pods or it comes as powder. But inside the pod, when you crack it open, sometimes they can crack easily with your hand or otherwise you can just use the side of a knife. When you open them up, the little seeds are inside and you just brush them out. It's a little bit tedious, but to me, you get a much better flavour than you do with the powder. If you can't be bothered, by all means, just put a little sprinkle of the powder in there. I've done that when I'm in a hurry. 
So we've got um, one and a half teaspoons of those cardamom seeds and we're just going to swirl them around in the pan until they are warm. Now, the, and we've also, sorry, we've also got a cinnamon quill and star anise. Now, we, as I said, we're just going to swirl them around until they're warm. The best way to tell is when you can smell it. Once you've smelt it, they're done. And I can actually smell that now, so I'm going to turn them off. Put them into a mortar and pestle and ask some strong man to uh, start frying them for me. <laughs> now, you want to a sip? no, not yet. <laughs> oh, too um, Now, the reason that I'm not toasting them any further than that is because we're using it in a dessert. If you wanted to make a curry and you wanted to make a really dark curry, you could toast them a lot further than that um, and get them really brown. If you keep going though, it is actually not too difficult to burn them. So it's that fine line. He's spraying everywhere. <laughs> it's the first time he's used it. <laughs> The reason I gave you that job is because I knew it would go everywhere. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so right? with the mortar and pestle, yeah, there's a couple of different ways you can use a mortar and pestle. You can do it like this where you literally are just pushing it. A mortar and pestle is best if it's heavy. This is a heavy one. It's not a big one, but it's a heavy one. And the reason... <laughs> what you're trying to do is you're actually trying to grind it apart. <laughs> If you've had a bad day, bang, 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 just keep going. If you're feeling a little calmer, circular motions help to grind it down. There's a dish that I, I use. Oh, I just realised I'm not mine. Oh, I am not. Sorry. Can you hear me? Okay, good. I thought, oh, I'll just talk for the last 10 minutes, nobody's heard what I've said. Um, here, I'll give, you, I'll, I'll give you a break. So, there's a, there's a savoury dish that I. See, I told you, it's not just you. There's a savoury dish that I do. See, my water and pestle is massive. Um, there's a savoury dish that I do that has spices in it as well. And if you actually add a little sprinkle of flaked salt, because it's quite a rigid um, substance, it actually helps to... See, this is why I don't like doing this, because it's a trestle table and I think I'll send the whole thing flying. Um, the salt actually helps to break it down. You know what? <coughs> okay, so... Sit down and talk to you after, do you? So what we're trying to do is get it to a fairly fine powder. Now spices, if you're using them for a savoury dish, don't necessarily need to be a fine powder because in some instances a little bit of texture is quite nice. But in this case, we, we're really looking more for the flavour than we are for any texture. So that should do us for now. Now, if I was at home, I'd keep going until it was really ground, but I'm not at home and I can't be bothered. So. <laughs> Uh, I need somewhere dry to put that. We'll just do it onto the, onto the bench. What we, it's important in this particular dish to sift it out now. The reason being is we only do want a very fine powder. And then we've got our spices ready to go. Now what we need to do is we need to create the praline. Now praline really is just cooked sugar. <laughs> Good. <laughs> a little bit nervous there. Um, I, I say to people, I never get nervous anymore. Master Chef took every last nervous thing out of me. I just have a nervous moment. <laughs> um, so, praline really is just toffee. That's all it is. It's cooked sugar. Technically, I could just put that sugar onto the heat and it will, it will cook and turn into toffee. The problem with doing it that way is that it cooks at an uneven rate because it's in different, you know, it sits in different thicknesses. And it's actually really hard to cook it evenly and not end up with some bits burning before other bits have even melted. Simple remedy is we just add a little bit of water. If we add enough water just to make it look like wet sand, that kind of consistency, what happens is, turn that down, what happens is um, it slows down that process and it gives us a chance to watch it change colour and to get it off the heat. So technically all we need is sugar, but we add a couple of other things to make life easy, water being the first one. The other thing we can add is this thing called glucose syrup. Glucose syrup is a crystal inhibitor. I don't know if you were in a year 10 class like I was where you had to do that experiment with a little beaker, a little bit of... I don't know what the liquid was. 
and a string that hang off a puddle pop stick and you came back the next week and it was covered in crystals. And the whole lesson was crystals love crystals and they join together and they, you know, stick together. I don't want that experiment in my dish. So I need to do what I can to stop crystals sticking to each other. The first step is to dissolve the sugar into the water thoroughly. And I need to do that over a low heat to start with until the water turns translucent. But the other thing is I slightly alter the chemical composition in there if I add a little bit of glucose syrup. Now glucose syrup is just found, it's about a tablespoon, but you know, when I write recipes I'm very thorough. When I cook I just chuck it in and it seems to work. Another master chef advantage. Um, so when you put the glucose syrup in there, it, yeah, it just it helps to stop doing to, to stop making crystals, which you know, when you're demonstrating in front of 270 people, really helpful to have it. But if I was doing it in my kitchen home, I probably wouldn't bother too much. There's another tip that also helps, and that's using a pastry brush with water. And if I, because what happens is as I stir it, it's hitting the sides of the pan. Can you see it in there? This bit on the side of the pan. Um, that will, as it cooks, cook faster than what's inside the pan because it's sitting on the edge and it can fall back in and then you've got a crystal mess in there again. So what we do is we just brush the side of the pan to get that gone. Now, I'm not actually dipping the brush into the sugar mixture. I'm pushing the water on the side of the pan to push those, crisp, those sugar, the sugar back into the water so that it can dissolve. Once it is all dissolved, so we can stir it gently. Once it's all dissolved, then we can raise the temperature and we can start making caramel, which is pretty much there. So now it's gone translucent, so it's quite a quick process. I'll give another quick brush just to make sure I haven't stirred more onto the side. And now we just can turn up the heat and let it do its thing. It will cook quicker on the outside edge than on the inside because the heat, particularly this one being a gas cooktop, will go up the sides of the pan and so that's where it's hottest. I'm not going to put my spoon back in and stir it because this spoon's now sitting out in the air starting to crystallise again. I don't want to put that back in there. Instead when it starts to colour what I'll do is swirl it around to try and even it out. What I do need to have nearby is a tray lined with paper so that I'm ready to pour that on when we go. Now, with caramel, you can use sugar thermometers and, you know, get it to exactly the right temperature that you want. But realistically, once it gets above 121 degrees, which is when it's still clear, it actually gets to a hard crack stage and so we know it will start to set. So I normally would do mine to about 165 degrees, which is kind of a mid-golden colour. But I don't use a sugar thermometer, I just use visual. So when it starts to colour in its first yellow, it's going to be, it, you'll end up with a sticky mess. It hasn't quite got to the point that it needs to. But once it is an even golden colour, it will start to be at the right temperature for it to go hard. If I was to add in something like bicarb soda, it would make honeycomb. And at that stage, it would look a bit like the honeycomb that's inside a violet crumble. You know that whitish kind of honeycomb? So it's what we call a very blonde caramel. If we were to cook it a bit further, we would end up with what's inside like a crunchy, you know, browner, more golden. You can then cook it further still and get it to a really dark caramel that sort of sits on the edge of bitterness, like it's a really deep, rich caramel. And then you can actually make it bitter. And sometimes in a dessert or even in a salad or something like that, a bitter caramel can be a nice element. If we take it further still, we get black carbon and nobody wants it. <laughs> and you have to chuck out the pan. So we're just going to sit there and let that do its thing. I'm aiming for sort of a mid-caramel for this particular dish. I don't want it too dark because that strong flavour will overpower the spices. Now what I was saying before about balance of flavour using sweet, sour, salt. Um, here we're adding the sweet element in the... Um, in the chocolate mousse, we're adding the, well, we're adding in a bitter element as well, as well as a bit of sweet. We're going to be doing a mandarin um, oil, which will have a slightly sour element. But the other thing that's really important is texture. When you think about taste, it is actually not just about flavour. 
And some chefs would argue that texture is even more important than flavour. Here we've got our chocolate mousse, which is going to be smooth and creamy. And here we've got a praline, which is going to be hard and crunchy. The thing with texture that you want in food is actually contrast. So it doesn't really matter which textures you go for, but if you have something creamy and crunchy together, the crunchy part will make the creamy taste even creamier. And the creamy will make the crunchy taste even crunchier. And so when we're creating a dish that we want to be exciting and well balanced, we're not just thinking about sweet, sour, salt, but we're also so thinking about contrast of texture because then it sort of pops in your mouth. You know how the judges sometimes talk about it just popped in my mouth? <laughs> Whatever that is. Anyway. <laughs> so it is just on the brink of changing colour. So while it does that, come and have a look. I don't know if you can see or do you want me to lift it out? The chocolate, I'll just grab another spoon, has melted and it's watery. Can you see in there? Yeah, so it's watery. I'm just I'm stirring it by hand just to show you how it comes together. And it starts to turn to what looks like a chocolate milk, really, or a chocolate sauce. And to think it's just chocolate and water. So what, once it's got to the stage where the chocolate will melt, but it hasn't been sitting there for the water to go cold, we don't want the water to go completely cold, we want it still, still warm. Lock that in. Um, now we just put it on low speed. And we whisk it until that comes right back down to room temperature and then we pour it into a container and put it in the fridge. Can you see inside this pot now? See how it's starting to change colour? It's a yellow colour, but it's actually a deeper golden around the edges. So I'm swirling it like this just to try and keep that colour even. Now different cooktops are going to take different amounts of time. Um, some cooktops are really powerful, so you'll get it done in a few minutes. Others are not so powerful, it might take you 20 minutes. So that's why I try and show you, it's more about the colour than it is about the time. Recipes are only ever meant to be a guide. And so often I think we stick to recipes, you know, we're standing there at the stove and it says, well, it said cook it on high for eight minutes. It looks like it's burning. Take it off. Okay, so we've got a nice golden colour. So what I'm gonna do is just pour that now onto my tray. Whatever you do, don't be tempted to lick that. <laughs> you laugh, my sister did it one time with a very nasty burn. Um, while it's still hot, we're going to take our spice mix that we've sieved. I haven't got a very flat table. That's all right. Um, and we're just going to sprinkle that mixture onto the praline. Now, there's all sorts of things you can do once you can do caramel. If you've mastered this part, you can do so many different things. So here we're making a spice cradling. You could instead sprinkle, oh, breathing in the spices. <coughs> you could instead sprinkle it with nuts or tip the nuts in and then pour it out. And you'd have um, a nut praline, so hazelnut or macadamia or anything like that, and it would do the same thing. You can also, um, when it's in the pot, when it's got to the colour you like, if you want to make a real caramel sauce, tip in some cream. And it will, it will actually react quite violently, but if you keep it over the heat and keep whisking it, it comes back together, the sugar remelts, and you have a beautiful, rich, creamy sauce. But you can play around with other liquids as well. So if you put orange juice in, you end up with an orange caramel syrup. One time I made a caramelised fish sauce as a dipping sauce for some Vietnamese spring rolls. It was made the same way, make a caramel but tip in fish sauce. So with recipes you can play around with them a lot but you just need to think about substituting solid things for solid things and liquid things for liquid things. Don't mess around with the quantities of the liquids or the solids too much. So if you want to substitute flour for um, a different type of flour, different flavour flour, or, a, or an almond meal, or something like that. Keep the weights of them the same. Likewise with the liquid, if you've got to put in 100 mils of cream, and you think, actually, I'd like that to be an orange juice syrup, make it 100 mils of orange juice. And you can play around with food so much like that. Now, because we're at a cooking demo, I'm not going to keep this going the whole time, partly because it's got a really annoying noise, but also, we don't really want to be here for the next three hours watching, you know, chocolate set. Won't take three hours, it'll probably take about half an hour. So once it is all smooth like that, 
you've got a couple of options. If you're doing it for a dessert for friends coming over, you can take a beautiful dessert glass and try and be very neat about it and pour it into the bottom of the glass. See, see how creamy it is? So we can do it like that and then pop it into the fridge. <coughs> the other alternative is you can just tip it into a, any old container and put it into the fridge and it will set. Um, and then we can quenelle it. So fortune, this is the bit I love about cooking demos. Here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> Except I didn't prepare it. <laughs> so I'm a very kind person made it for me. But this is what it looks like. You know, it's solid. Um, so it just sets and all it is is chocolate and water. You will get a much richer chocolate flavour than if you fold in egg whites and cream because obviously that lightens it. But it's a really decadent, fudgy mousse. Um, what's really important about a chocolate mousse recipe like this though is that you choose good quality chocolate that you like to eat because it is all about the chocolate. There's no other flavour in there to mask it. So if you're going to use a cheap chocolate, it's going to taste like a cheap mousse. If you're going to use, and it doesn't mean you have to use really expensive chocolate. On MasterChef, we used Kovacha chocolate. It was about $80 a kilo. Yeah, it tasted amazing. But uh, it was quite funny actually. When I came home and started recipe, recipe testing for my cookbook, my husband said to me, You do realise our food budget's not the same as MasterChef's. <laughs> um, but yeah, try and choose a chocolate that you like eating. If you like eating the chocolate, you'll like the mousse. And it should work quite well. Somebody has asked me once, will it work with white chocolate? I'm not sure. I haven't actually played around with it. White chocolate is technically not chocolate. It's actually just cocoa butter. I always melt my white chocolate in the microwave. Um, it will only work if it's Kovacha white chocolate in the microwave. Um, if it's just those cheap little buttons, they seize up. So there are differences as well in the quality of white chocolate. So if you want to play with it, send me an email and let me know if it works or not. All right, so we've got our praline set in here and we've got our chocolate mousse either in our glass ready to go or in a container and I'll show you in a minute about quenelling that. I'll just put the kettle back on. And the other element for this is a mandarin oil. Now, um, everybody knows that chocolate goes beautifully with orange. You think of Jaffa's, yeah? For me, with when, I, when I create new desserts, I like to think of traditional flavours and then go slightly left of centre. So this is an example of that. Rather than using orange, I'm going to use mandarin. Very similar characteristics, but something that's just a little bit different. If mandarins aren't in season, by all means use orange. Doesn't matter. Um, but I want to show you this little trick because it's so such a simple way to add flavour to things. It's simply flavouring an oil. Now in this particular case, um, with this dessert, I don't want the oil to taste of anything other than mandarin. So I need to use a low flavoured oil, something that's very bland. Grapeseed oil is generally my preference just because it's a nice quality oil, but it has no very, very little flavour. Um, but vegetable oil will work just as well and it's nice and cheap. And all we do is tip, it, tip a bit into a bowl. I think I say in the recipe of a quarter of a cup, really doesn't matter, however much you need. And then we simply get a microplane zester and zest the mandarin. Now the majority of flavour from any citrus is actually found in its zest. But the, the really important thing is to not zest too much. If you get that white pith, and a mandarin zest is even thinner than an orange zest, if you get that white pith, you get a horrible bitterness. I know you can add bitterness in some dishes and it could work, this pith, not a good bitterness. Um, and so just, you just grate it in ever so, simple, so lightly. The reason I pour it into a bowl and zest into the bowl rather than zesting onto a plate and then tipping it into the bowl, and you probably won't be able to see this on the camera, but if you look up close when you're doing it yourself, you can see the tiny little oils bounce into the oil, into the oil and that's what we want. We want those oils in there as well. We want as much of that flavour as we possibly can. Something I was taught on MasterChef was think about how you can get flavour in at every opportunity. So rather than just putting, so if, a, if a recipe says boil it in water, think about something else watery that you could boil it in, a stock or a wine 
or, or even just add something to the water, bay leaves, thyme, onion, anything like that. Add flavour at every possible point and what you end up is what those judges talk about with depth of flavour and layers of flavour. Straight cooking in water will certainly work, but by adding something else in there, you just add another dimension that, that stimulates the palate. And this is all we do. We simply zest into the oil and then we let it sit. Ideally, it needs to sit for at least an hour, but you can actually do it a week in advance. So this is a great dessert for doing when people are coming around because everything is done ahead of time. Your praline's done ahead of time and left in a uh, airtight container, because sugar has to be kept in an airtight container, particularly in Sydney where you have humidity. And if it's rainy weather, it can be problematic if you leave it out too long. The chocolate mousse is done and in the fridge, and your mandarin oil is done. It doesn't need to go in the fridge. In fact, it's better if it's not. And it just sits there for as long as you've got. So you've got your three components, your friends come around and you say, okay, time to plate up. Don't you love the way MasterChef's changed our language? <laughs> so what we're going to do is I'm simply going to do a quenelle. I think I might have not seen... Have we got a bigger spoon around? If not, I can do little ones, but bigger tip generally works better. To do a quenelle, so quenelle is, is really just an egg-shaped spoonful of something. Most people tend to quenelle using two spoons, um, which you can do. You end up with a little ridge line, which is fine. It's just something that's a bit trendy at the moment in food um, places. So I thought I'd show you. The best way to do it, hmm, running out of space. The be I'll just use that, it won't matter. The best way I find to do it is hot water and one spoon. You can use any size spoon. But you do, it is one of those things that takes practice. When I was at, in the house at MasterChef, I'd often sit down with a bowl of whipped cream and just sit there practicing quenelling, just while I was talking to people, because I wanted to be able to do it, and the only way you can do it is to practice, practice, practice. Thank you so much. All right, so we put our spoons in the hot water and allow them a bit of time to heat up, and that way it's gonna make um, our quenelling much easier. The way that I find it easier to do, and here's hoping it works the first time, but is to actually push the spoon away from you and then do a quick shuffle back. And you end up with an egg shape like that. See, practice pays off. Anyway, pull up all you like. Now, the next thing I would do, so I'm just trying to show you different ways of doing the same dessert, you know. I would then add my mandarin oil and I would put a little bit over the top, a little bit on the plate. If I was doing it in the cup, obviously that's not set. If it was set, I would just add just a very fine film of it, not very much of it over the top. Um, and then we've got our praline. Getting myself in a big mess. Um, I'm going to put that without making a big mess. So, with our praline, it should, with time, become crispy so that it breaks into shards. Now, where this is, is a bit thicker, that's probably still soft. Oh no, it's actually quite hard, there we go, good. Um, it is slightly on the warm side. The ideal is to leave it till it comes completely to room temperature. And then you've got a couple of options. If you've got something like this, it's ideal for breaking up praline. You just put shards of this into your blender with the blade on and blitz it, and what you end up with are crumbs that look a bit like this. I call them jewels, because they look a little bit like jewels. Um, and, and you can then use them. Or the other alternative, if you don't have one of those, is simply to use a knife. And you just break it up like that. Let them break randomly, and you end up with these pretty little random shapes that then you can sprinkle around the plate and onto there, because you've got a little bit of crunch. If you end up with a nice little shard, you can stick him in the top. And what I like to finish off is, just because I love, I love salt in my desserts, my husband thinks I'm going to die of heart failure, he's probably right. Uh, but a little sprinkle of salt on chocolate is something I like to do, it's not to everybody's taste, but if you like to. So it's a really easy dish that you can do simply in a glass or have a go at quenelling. 
Everything's made ahead of time and it uses what I think is probably the best ingredient in the world, chocolate. So hopefully you've learned a few little tips. Uh, that is fantastic. Now on the morning shows, the hosts who come up always get to have a little taste. <laughs> All yours. <laughs> delicious. Good. Absolutely Good. delicious. I'll pay you after. <laughs> Even better than my mashed potato. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Let's give her another round of applause.